If I could push a button, it would be to have that support from Republicans and Democrats and independents so we can talk about other things, not just talk about should the country have a vibrant, vital public media service. Well, this is just about one of the most exciting moments for me to be able to interview Patricia Harrison, Patricia DeStacy Harrison, right here, the president and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And you're in Cookville. I am, finally. Who knew? You knew. <laughs> <laughs> I did know because I've just hounded you, and you're so great to care about all the stations within our system. And that means a lot. And, and why is that? Why is it that this landscape of public media is so important? Because we're not one size fits all, because America has uh, a lot of stories and we have a lot of storytellers and it's not homogenized. All of these diverse stories, this tapestry of this great country, uh, really need to be represented. And so unlike commercial media, uh, because we're commercial free and for free, we take the time because we have the time to tell the story, to honor the story of average people, sometimes famous people, sometimes fictional people. Mm -hmm. But it's very important because a station like WCTE has its own unique connection to the community. And that community is not duplicated in the same way anywhere else. Now, yes, it's a small station, it serves a rural community, but it's distinctive, and that's important. When I know you travel a lot around the country visiting stations and, and the people that we serve, and that's really what it's about for you and for all of us, right? It's the people. Yes, we like to say public media is on air, online, and on the ground, and what we mean is the community and the station are are together they're partners and in terms of if you look at our federal appropriation and the unique way that american public media has been created the federal appropriation is a percentage of a station's overall budget that station then has to go into the community and raise the rest of the money and the way they raise it really gives the community a chance to provide the station with what I would call a report card. So the station and the community never get too far apart from one another. How did that come about? How, how did that well, really happen? <laughs> Actually, um, we had a series of uh, educational stations mm -hmm. until um, President Lyndon Johnson took a look at the landscape of American uh, education, American broadcasting, and in some of his um, speeches, remarks, his papers, he was really a futurist. It's so surprising to hear some of the things he said that we had to had the most advanced technology. Now, this is, of course, way before anybody thought about the, the techno toys we're, we're playing with now or how we're online and how we're communicating, how important it was for the American people to have this service, this system that primarily focused on education. And education beyond grades or high school or, or preschool, while that was very, very important, it was more or less the education of a free people. Mm -hmm. So our civil society would be strengthened, our democracy would be secure, and of course education in all of its forms is tied to that. Mm -hmm. So that idea to have a public media service, <coughs> excuse me, um, crea they created CPB, where the steward of the federal appropriation, with a majority of these funds going to public media, uh, radio, and television stations. But there are lots of caveats connected to this federal appropriation, as there should be. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like talking about, because it's so unique to this country, 
America's public media service is not duplicated anywhere in the world. Most public media in other countries is totally supported by the government. Here, it's entrepreneurial. You get a very important amount, but a small amount through the federal appropriation. And then, as I said, stations raise, on the average, six times that original amount. But that initial amount is crucial and defines the real character of American public media, enabling us to provide this content that matters for free and commercial free. It's sort of like the foundation of a house, isn't it? Very it really much is. so. Very much so. And then, you know, it's like you, you... Ronald Reagan said that the government should provide the spark and then the community or whatever the entity is should do the rest. And that's what WCTE has done. The spark of the federal appropriation mm -hmm. has led you to connect to the community and raise funds to ensure the community is served. Well, we're, we're thrilled that you're here, and we're thrilled to be able to serve the community. We, we have a, a wonderful region of the Upper Cumberland, which we're going to be having. Looking to forward. To As I right. said earlier, I may never leave. So. <laughs> That'll be a good thing. <laughs> Whatever happened to Pat, she That's visited, right. she, read and she just decided leave. she wasn't going back to That's D.C. Right. You know, we're, we're doing some things. You're talking about entrepreneurial. We're doing some things that are that. We're, we've, uh, we have a technical campus at University, Tennessee Tech University, and then we also have a technical campus or, or a, an actual community campus right here in downtown Cookville. But we feel very strongly connected to all Middle Tennessee and the 14 counties. And I think it is that on-the-ground piece uh, that's so interesting and so different in public media. And there's a number of initiatives through CPB that you have just championed. And, and I think you champion them because you are so passionate about the people and and especially people who maybe haven't had opportunities. Uh, so American Graduate and Women and Girls Lead and uh, Community Cinema, all of these WCTs involved in. But why, why are you so passionate about these and just are, you're just fearless as our leader with that? Well, that's a very difficult question <laughs> to ask. Uh, why are you the way you are? But I think growing up in Brooklyn, New York, you're formed by your environment. You're formed by the things you see. And I grew up, um, I'm of uh, Italian heritage, a couple of other things running through there. Um, but I grew up in a neighborhood where my friends didn't have any relatives because they had all been murdered in the Holocaust. So at a very young age, I think I began to look at my world as uh, my responsibility, that there's justice and injustice. And if you have a brain, and if, if you are pretty much OK economically, you have a responsibility to connect to people who may not have that opportunity. And so very early on, looking at the world scene, through public media, by the way, and NPR, I just felt that there was a lot I could do. I couldn't do everything, but that wasn't a reason not to do the one thing that I could do. And most recently, you mentioned American Graduate. We have one million young people dropping out of school, failing to graduate every single year. Why should we care? You know, you see those bumper stickers that say, my child is an honor student, and that's wonderful. But if the majority of kids in this country are not even graduating, never mind becoming honor students, that impacts our community. It impacts our kids down the road. It impacts our country. And so I'm so proud of stations like WCTE and others who have really made it um, a very effective initiative. Not one size fits all. The, all it comes down to is the community caring about the kids in the community. And so, what is it, two years ago, we started this. And we now have 800 community business partners across the country. We've had American Graduate Day, seven hours plus streaming, and thousands of people agreeing to be mentors. A lot of things that stations are doing 
and the reason it's so important, it's local. So it's a n national content, local content. It's sort of the perfect storm. And the good news, the numbers are starting to go down. Or I should say, the numbers are starting to go up of kids staying in school and getting their diploma. That's exciting. That really has it really impact. It really is. And then Women and Girls Lead is another great initiative that PBS and um, based on uh, Half the Sky, mm -hmm. uh, the Nick Kristoff book of just not unusual stories, just women who are trying to live a, a life of uh, safety and achievement in their own way, um, help their families go to school and who are struggling with very basic rights that we have here. So all of this ties into public media and public media caring and the people who support public media caring about these issues. Let's talk about, you talked about growing up in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> That'll what, take 40 we could talk, we could. A lot of therapy goes with that. <laughs> what was that like? It was wonderful. It was really wonderful. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, at the event tonight, but it was a place where parents had high expectations. Nobody went around asking very much, how do you feel today? <laughs> <laughs> no, you would come home uh, with your report card and very, very happy, you got a B plus. And the first thing your mother or father would say, who got the A? Mm. Why wasn't it you? <laughs> it was very competitive. And um, people at that time really regarded teachers as royalty. And if something was wrong, <laughs> mm -hmm. it wasn't the teacher's fault. It was your fault. So you didn't even bother complaining about your teacher, that the teacher was unfair. There was, you, you wouldn't even go there. And I, looking back, realized I got such a world-class education at PS99 and then Midwood High School. Uh, because I was surrounded by people in a community who kept telling you that education is the key to opportunity and to really lifelong learning is, is the key mm -hmm. to success. You, I, I heard you say one time uh, that you should always continue to learn, that you, you're you an, an active example of that. You, you really well, challenging and encourage I, I think us we to have, now we have all the studies that show um, you want to care about something. You want to keep your brain and your heart and your soul engaged. And, and I think, you know, people are always taking these tests about are, are they physically fit? Can they run 15 miles in 10 minutes? But there's another test you should take. Am I, what do I stand for? You know, my favorite song is, is from fun, period, the group. <laughs> uh, what do I stand for? And it helps to ask yourself that because it can guide you toward uh, doing things uh, no matter what stage of life you happen mm -hmm. to be. And so much of what you can do is through your local public television station or radio station. Mm -hmm. You can volunteer. You can get very interested in supporting some of the preschool programs. Um, I think in American life we have that volunteer DNA and that's what keeps you vibrant. And what about growing up Italian? <laughs> <laughs> now that's a whole other show. Um, <laughs> you know, growing up Italian, and I do serve on the board of the National Italian American Foundation, was very, very important because the, the, the message to me was family was the most important thing. It didn't matter if you became a big shot <laughs> because everyone around the table in my family thought they were big shots anyway. <laughs> you know, in their mind. Right. And that love of life and a connection to family is more important than anything. Mm -hmm. And so as I have gone along in my life at very different levels of responsibility and feeling, well, this is really, this is really something. All it takes is a visit back to family to find out maybe not so much. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And I think we can all identify with that. Well, now, you are a big shot. I mean, you know, you, I, I, you, you just, you are. You, you've had an incredible career in 
public affairs. I've had an, uh, a wonderfully interesting opportunity at so many different levels to do things I never thought I could do. You were, you were the Deputy Secretary of State. Well, I was Assistant Secretary uh, for Educational Cultural Affairs, mm -hmm. and then um, Secretary Powell um, had me as Colin his Powell. Yes, right? so Colin Powell, yes, sure, yeah. uh, under acting under Secretary of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs when the current Under Secretary uh, resigned. Mm -hmm. And so in a, I was my own boss. I reported to myself a very dangerous thing. <laughs> But a great time, I must say. I liked working for me very much. Did you? It was good. Well, it had to be a challenging time, though. It was, but uh, I was surrounded by incredible people like mm -hmm. Helen Savage, who's mm -hmm. with me today, and some of the people um, I work with today at, at CPB. It was a very challenging time, but you also felt you were serving your country. And it, in, in that period of time, I was able to go to Iraq and restart the Fulbright program in, well, actually in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, and uh, work uh, with women, Afghan women teachers, who had, to me, they will always be the epitome of courage. These were women, you would say average women, no name <laughs> branding, anything here. Uh, who would teach young girls and move their little classroom from cave to cave so the Taliban would not uh, find them. They put their lives at risk, that of their own children, their family, and we were thrilled when we were able to bring them over in conjunction with the University of uh, Nebraska to give them a training, teacher training, that they hadn't been able to get. And I asked one of them, it's one of my favorite stories, I said, how did you find the courage to do this? And the woman said, it wasn't courage, it was just the right thing to do. And I thought, oh boy, here am I sitting in my nice cozy environment. And you, you go back and you say to yourself, hmm, what am I doing? Courageous today, you know, other than avoiding carbs, um, you know. <laughs> right. So uh, we met amazing people. We met, um, oh, very sad, uh, these, these businessmen from uh, Iraq who we brought over. And why did we bring them to this country? Because they needed surgery on their hands. They had been put in Abu Ghraib prison and they had been tortured. Now why were they tortured? Because they had just stores and they were trying to make a living, and Saddam Hussein had decided they were enemies of the state. And they were all good, faithful Muslims, and their hands were gone. So they were able, we were able to fly them uh, to actually Dallas, and um, was it Houston or Dallas? Houston, Houston, of course. And amazing work was done. And we had a meeting with all of them, and they were leaders from the Washington business community and all over. And I looked around the table as, as these people were talking and it was all you could do not to really uh, just cry. And I thought, none of these men around the table who are listening to this, they're like stone faced. Why aren't they moved by this story? And after we had our lunch and we moved out and I asked one of them, the, you know, the, the one person who was chairing the meeting, he said, I was thinking what I was going to say when I go home and I tell my children who I met today. And I realized if, if I allowed myself to really feel what I was feeling, I wouldn't be able to conduct the meeting. So sometimes you don't know how deeply people feel just by looking at them. And there were many stories like that, international visitors who came here and could not believe how Americans volunteer. Just decide one day we're going to make a difference in this community. Let's have a meeting. Let's get together. You do this. You do that. And so many of them were um, inspired to go back to their own countries and do the same thing. You've totally, I think, taken that experience and transferred it to public media. Well, that's why I was so thrilled to move from state to CPB, because I could see similar mission. The mission 
at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs was to increase mutual understanding and respect between people of other countries and the United States. And the mission of public media is actually to do the same thing, because by telling these stories, American stories, we have an opportunity to sit back, listen or watch, and say, well, I care about that, too. That person looks very different from me. But they're talking about the same things, the same fears, the same hopes, you know, the, 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 uh, what you want for your family and what you want for your children. So it's a connector. And that's why it strengthens our democracy. We can hear this conversation without being interrupted by commercials. We have a time, in a way, to think, mm -hmm. to understand what is it we're actually hearing and to form our own opinions. What, do, what is probably one of the most engaging moments for you in, in your work in, at CPB? You've, you've met some incredible people. And I know the Half the Sky piece has to be one of the top moments. But what are there others? That... Yeah, every time I go to a station, because the, when I first came to CPB, they said, well, Pat, you've heard this before, right? And I hadn't. If you've seen one public television station, you've seen one public <laughs> television station. Just the uniqueness, the difference in communities. And you come back from these travels feeling very good about America. Then you get into D.C. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> But you do. And uh, I have to say American Graduate is something that um, I'm very proud of. And all the work you've done and the other general managers, we are turning these kids' lives around. These kids are worth it. They're bright. They've had maybe not the same environment we've had growing up. Schools are really, really different today. And through the teacher town hall meetings, I'm sitting there listening to these teachers talk about what they have to do before they even open a book. You have children who are hungry, children who were kicked out of the house, kids who uh, really don't have a stable home life, who come in and they can't focus on learning. And we're asking these teachers, you be the Salvation Army, you be the Red Cross, you be the teacher, and then let us criticize the job that you're <laughs> attempting to do. It's got to be a partnership. The student has to have responsibility, the parents, the teachers, the community. So I think American Graduate says it all, because we all like to think that young person graduates from kindergarten to first grade. Then you go on and on. You graduate from high school, and that's not the end. You go to college. You graduate from college. You graduate into a job. You graduate into different stages of your life. As Americans, we're always recreating ourselves. I mean, this country has proven to be, even with all of our challenges, even with all our problems, still the land of opportunity if you're prepared to access that opportunity. So American Graduate helps these young people understand they've got to stay on this path. In the, and you're, you're so right. In, in the couple of moments we have left, you, you have children and, and you- I do. We want to talk about yeah, them. <laughs> I do. Because that's a special thing. I am just so lucky. I have incredible kids, and they're not as much fun as they used to be, because they all have children now, and they can't go and play with me the way they used to. But they are amazing. My son lives in California, and he is a CEO of a company. And he has two children. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> My okay. uh, middle daughter lives a couple blocks away from me, and she has three children. And when anything's missing from my jewelry box, I know Claudia has visited. <laughs> and then my youngest daughter lives in California, and she has a little boy, Aiden, and the distance is just too far, California to wow. D.C. So we all try to get together um, in the summer, and we all try to plan one mega trip, uh, if we can, together um, once a year. But they're, they're the most fun. That's they're, so they're great. They're the best. Did, yeah. and are you a real high-achieving family, just like you were? We're an everybody? annoying family. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a boss, and yeah. everyone has an opinion. And um, it's, it, it's, be fun. it's kind of fun. You know, there's a saying in New York uh, that 
conversation in New York is talking mm -hmm. and waiting to talk. So <laughs> we kind of all talk at once. That's great. But Just, it works. You know, Pat, this has been such a treat. We only have a minute left, really. But what, what do you want for the future for WCTE, but for all of public media? Well, what I'd like is for the wonderful men and women in Congress, and I mean that sincerely, people who go into political life and choose to serve, it's a very important job for them to really, really do a deep dive in public media and understand we're part of the solution. We're not the problem. We're basic, average Americans who are connecting to our community with high quality content. How often can you say that about anything that educates, informs, and entertains in a way that uplifts the spirit and brings people together? If they really understood that at a core level, we're not saying we don't understand that everyone in hard economic times has to take a hit, but our communities have all been hit and they're still supporting public media. And I think that's the one thing, if I could push a button, it would be to have that support from Republicans and Democrats and independents so we can talk about other things, not just talk about should the country have a vibrant, vital public media service. Well, I think that's a goal we're all going to shoot for. <laughs> I so, think so. Thank you, my friend, for thank being you. here and for this opportunity. My pleasure.